speaking again about Islam. Uh, Lloyd uh, de Jung, our special guest, is going to teach us about uh, Freemasonry uh, in Islam and uh, the occult. I would like to remind you that this is a part of a series, an ongoing series, and we have all the previous recordings available. So Lloyd, thank you very much for coming as usual, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Much of what I am going to discuss tonight, this is this should be the final episode on this particular series of talks. And I would encourage you to look at the earlier ones so you get the context for what I'm going to be discussing tonight. I have gone in depth through the Islamic law, what is known as the Sharia. And so the focus has not just been on this, the Quran and the Hadith, but really on Islamic law, which is the expansion and the final interpretation of the the Quran, the Sunnah, the Tafsir, and so on. So this is my YouTube channel for those of you who uh, want to know more. I've also been recording the episodes and I've been putting them up here. Uh, they're under the title Telegram Talks. Uh, the last Telegram Talk was the Palestinian... No, 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 we had prior to that, we had the Palestinian occupation of Israel and we discussed the Palestinian Nazis and the very, very tight alliance that the Palestinians and the Muslims had with the Nazi organization during World War II and even prior to World War II and then we discussed previously the Islamic slave trade and we compared that with the Western slave trade and we can find that the Islamic slave trade was about 200 times larger than the Atlantic slave trade. The American slave trade lasted about 76 years. The Islamic slave trade has lasted for about 1,400 years. Of course, no one is offended by that because that would be racist and Islamophobic and uh, of course we do know that the American slave trade ended about 154 years ago. The Islamic slave trade is ongoing today in numerous countries in Africa. But again, we cannot criticize them because that would just, you know, you can only blame white people, Jews and the Catholic Church, as we all know. I want to just mention this in case I forget later. I want us to remember that this is the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, a very close friend of the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood was a Freemason and a Sufi and um, founded the world's largest terror group, which has since <laughs> inspired about 200 different Islamic terror organizations. This is him meeting with Adolf Hitler. This is him greeting his Nazi troops because he raised in total about 70,000 troops to fight for the Nazis in Europe. And he also raised an army of about 600,000 that fought for the Nazis in Africa, as I recall. So yes, this was him with his Nazi salute here and um, wonderful guy all around. Um, he and Hitler, this is him and uh, him and Goering of the SS. That's him again there. So yeah, great guy, great guy. Loved him some Nazis and uh, yeah, an inspiration to everyone in Palestine by all accounts. So on that school, let me bring up my PowerPoint presentation. So I'll pick up where I left off, right? So this is like fifth or sixth discussion on this particular topic. So if you've missed the rest, you, you may be a little lost, but I'll see if I can ease you into it. So we ended off discussing, talking about Islam, talking about its, its Gnostic links, how it is derived from Gnosticism. I'm actually doing ongoing research in much more depth on that exact topic. Um, so consider this an overview, an introduction, and I'm going into far, far more depth on that subject. But I'm also going to be discussing Islamic occultism, which is an integral part of Islam very little studied, very little known. However, it is something that is that runs deep and runs from the beginning of Islam. Right. So this here is a series of YouTube videos, very easy to find. The Muslims don't hide the fact that Islam is Gnostic and that the Sufis are the Gnostic practitioners. They're the, they're the mystical religious practitioners that effectively, according to the Islamic law, practice and intercede and pray on behalf of the Muslim nation. So today we're going to be talking about the Templars, we're going to talk about Baphomet, the KKK, the Freemasons, the Shriners, and a little bit more. Okay, and this is my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Lloyd de Jong. So it's just under my name if you uh, want, to, want to get more involved with that. There's a common hysteria about the fact that apparently the Mossad says that um, by deception, by way of deception, you will do war. No one seems to have a problem that Sun Tzu said the same thing 5,000 years ago. And of course, no one has a problem that long before Masad was a gleam in anyone's eye, Muhammad said that war is a game of deceit. 
right? So he seemed to share the same views, but of course, again, it would be racist and Islamophobic to blame Muhammad, so therefore we can only blame the Jews because, you know, that's just how everyone rolls uh, with sheer hypocrisy. I, I need to remind everyone that sarcasm is one of my major superpowers and it can only be used for good. Politics is downstream from culture, a very popular saying. Unfortunately, everyone leaves out the second part of that statement. Culture is downstream from religion. Culture is downstream from your moral system. And we've discussed in depth the Islamic moral system, which is by the standards of Christian Western thought and culture, it is immoral. Of course, it is not fully implemented yet, but once it is, as you see under ISIS or under the Taliban, you see how immoral and violent it actually does become. We have a saying in the West, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Muslims have a different saying. They say, do not let your enemy know he is your enemy, because war is a game of deceit. Right, so now I want to mention this interesting little tidbit. There's lots of little tidbits all over the place, and if you start to put them together, they start to add up. This is the Amas Charter, Article 2. It says the Islamic resistance movement is one of the wings of the Muslim Brotherhood in Palestine. Of course, the Muslim Brotherhood is a very, very large secret society and has millions of members and millions, tens of millions of adherents. The Muslim Brotherhood is a universal organization which constitutes the largest Islamic movement in modern times. Founded in 1928, it has the goal of toppling America in 2028 and from there taking over the entire world because Islam has to form a caliphate according to its law and it must impose the Sharia on everybody on the entire planet. It is characterized by its deep understanding, accurate comprehension and its complete embrace of all Islamic concepts of all aspects of life, culture, creed, politics, economics, education, society, justice, and judgment. Notice, though, that we call Islam a religion. Islam calls itself a deen. And I have covered the definition of deen on multiple occasions from the Lisan al-Arab, the most respected of the Islamic dictionaries, 20 volumes. And it states that a deen is a totalitarian political system which uses force to subjugate others and humiliate them under control, right? Now, everyone does talk about the mysterious they, that mostly referring to the Jews or the Roman Catholic Church, or maybe the aliens from Mars, take your pick. But of course, they fail to mention the fact that Islam quite explicitly, unambiguously, in your face, has pretensions to taking over the world under its totalitarian deen, which is a system of domination and complete subjugation and humiliation of those on whom it enforces the Sharia. Back to the Amas Charter. So, they are also about the spreading of Islam, education, art, information, and the science of the occult, and conversion to Islam. Very often this term, science of the occult, is hidden under euphemisms, hidden behind euphemisms. But the science of the occult, because few people realize and few people know that Islam has a very deep very much involved system of occult magic which goes back to the beginning which they claim traces its roots to the Egyptian magical cults. Now that doesn't mean they necessarily literally mean Egypt but they mean the Babylonian Canaanite you know that, that sort of era that sort of location because that eventually went to Egypt and then eventually that was brought in by by these especially by the Sufis who are the elite within Islam. Right. Now, I'll just briefly touch on this guy. This is Baron Rudolf von Sabatendorf. Now, you can find lots about him online, or rather, rather you can, well, you can find lots about him that may or may not be accurate. It takes a long time to untangle all of this, but this is Baron von Sabatendorf having tea with Hitler. Uh, this is Baron von Sabatendorf in 1933 with his police photo taken in Munich after he wrote a book called Before Hitler Came, Before Hitler Came, where he explicitly states that he inspired Hitler to write Mein Kampf. Uh, Mr. von Sabotendorf, who has a different name, but we're not going to go into much detail about him today, traveled to the Middle East, ended up in various countries, and eventually ended up in Turkey. Blah, 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 Freemasonry, blah, 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 Freemason, blah, 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 Sufi, blah, 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 moved to Germany, founded the Thule Society, which in, well, he also founded a newspaper, took over a newspaper, and this newspaper, well, let's let's continue. This is him, that's Baron von Sabotendorf. 
So, he died in 1945 under mysterious circumstances. Some say he was found drowned in the Bosporus in Turkey. Others, I've read another report which says he was in Switzerland at the time. Many say he was suicide dead, cause, and some say he died from suicide. He was a Freemason and a practitioner of alchemy. Of course, alchemy comes from an Arabic word, alchemia, uh, because, well, anyway, it's got Islamic roots, but that would be Islamophobic to talk about it. So in 1900, he moved to Turkey, where he met, and I love the way they say the Jewish Termudi family, who apparently came from Sicily, I believe. But interesting, if these families, this family was Sufis, because they, one also learns that this family was Sufis, then they were Muslims. So they talk about the Jewish lineage and fail to mention that they are Muslims. Somehow this always accidentally happens. They introduced him to Rosicrucianism and led to his initiation into a local Masonic lodge. In 1910, he founded the Lodge of the Bektashi Order of Sufis in Constantinople. He returned to Germany, I think, in 1911, and in 1917, he founded the Thule Society, an occult organization that led to the German Workers' Party, which was joined, I believe, in 1918, actually, by, by Adolf Hitler, who then transformed it into the Nazi Party. So the Thule Society, an occult organization that had r the high-level ranks of the Nazis, involved, very much in depth, involved with it from Rudolf Hess and many, many others, right, who were all members. They then eventually in 1917 or 1918 became the German Workers' Party, which then became the German National Socialists known as the Nazis. So it's also that the newspaper he founded was obviously to promote the, the Aryan ideas of Aryanism and of course was extremely racist, blatantly racist, and this newspaper was then sold to the Nazis and, you know, um, so, yeah, the, he has direct involvement with Hitler, direct involvement with Nazis, and of course he was even having tea with Hitler, so they were on good terms. So Bottentorf left the Thule Society, and uh, read this all with a little grain of salt, the way this is phrased, but then he fled to Turkey, right? Now, this here is one of his books, Secret Practices of the Sufi Freemasons, the Islamic Teachings at the Heart of Alchemy. So, of course, and this is one of many sources where one can discover that the Sufis claim to be the originators of Freemasonry. Of course, they state that there are different strands of Freemasonry, the two major strands, and the one was a pale offshoot. But even the major strand, which kind of there's a, there's a, shall we say, they provide some recommendation for. This strand, I'll get into that when I do the talk on Baron von Sabotno, before I get into that actual discussion. Um, they contain more of the learnings that they got from the Muslims, right, in terms of the Freemasonic knowledge. Now, well, so also these Sufis all claim that they are the founders of Freemasonry because they are the original Freemasons. Now, this book claims to reveal the secret spiritual exercises of the Bektashi order of the Sufis. It shows how this order, also known as Oriental Freemasonry, preserves the ancient spiritual doctrines forgotten by modern Freemasonry. It explains how to transform the soul into the what they call the alchemical magnum opus, right, the masterpiece, by combining Masonic grips and the abbreviated letters of the Quran. Uh, so I won't go into depth on that now, I have discussed this in the past, but they're talking about becoming the perfect man, the superman, the ubermensch, one has to wonder where Hitler got that idea. It could be because he was having tea with a guy who belonged to an order that taught how to become the Superman, what they call the Qutb or the Insan al-Kamal, so that you can perfect yourself and become the perfect man. And uh, yeah, so there's a direct link between these Sufi teachings, Baron von Sabotendorf and Hitler and the Nazis. Originally published in Germany in 1924, this rare book by von Sabotendorf reveals the secret spiritual exercises of the Bektashi order of Sufis and how this order, known as blah blah blah, right, Sabotendorf explains how the mysterious abbreviated letters found represent formulas. These are these, about 20% of the Quran is considered to be gibberish, they mean nothing, they're just nonsense letters. But he says that these letters all have a magical property, and in fact, the letters of the Islamic alphabet within the Quran they form a kind of occult magic called onomatomancy, right? It's a derivative or it's a parallel to what you would know as the uh, Hebrew gematria. But they've got their own form of occult ritual magic related to numerology and, as I said, it's called onomatomancy. So, they represent formulas for perfecting the spirit of the individual. Now, so he claims that the Quran has a secret layer of meaning, secret levels of meaning, there's secret knowledge embedded within 
the Quran. A little bit about Baron Rudolf von Sobotendorf. Now, he became a Rosicrucian, and the Rosicrucians were a German secret society founded by, quote-unquote, a mysterious character who may or may not even be historical, called Christian Rosenkrantz. He's an alchemist, again, alchemy, that connection to alchemy, who claimed to have gained his spiritual knowledge from his travels in the Middle East, where he got knowledge from Sufi sheikhs in Morocco. Hmm, the Sufis come up again. I wonder why that is. No, Obviously, no connection to anything at all. Uh, because as we know, Islam has nothing to do with Islam. So in 1913, Sobotendorf returned to Germany with his wealth inherited from his adoptive father and apparently marrying a rich wo woman and a vast knowledge of the East. So he made contact with various leaders of the German occult and mystical groups. He then came to the attention of Rudolf Hess and Hermann Paul of the Germanen Order and helped to found the journal Runen and the Münchener Beobachter, uh, the Munich Observer. The later journal was eventually purchased by the Nazi party. So apparently he was requested to sell this very successful recruiting newspaper. It was designed for recruitment to sell it to the Nazi party. It then became the Völkische Beobachter and it happened to include all of the racist and supremacist themes that the Nazis were famous for. So Sobotendorf then oversaw the founding of the Thule Society and it became the cradle of the National Socialist Movement. And in 1933 he took credit for inspiring Hitler's Mein Kampf in his book Before Hitler Came. Before Hitler Came. Right, I'll leave that there for now and we'll discuss Baron von Sobotendorf in the future. Now, we've discussed in depth the Gnostic links to Islam. I will in the future discuss more, much more detail on the Gnostic links within Islam. Uh, this is a book by Arthur Jeffrey, I think his name is, a very famous scholar of Islam. And he writes in his book, Islam, Muhammad and his religion, that the old Arabian paganism was in the process of disintegration. But Judaism and Christianity were widely represented in the Arabian Peninsula and to a lesser extent, Zoroastrianism and certain many Gnostic sects. So several preachers of monotheism had arisen and each had gained a following, but it was Muhammad who succeeded in syncretizing certain elements of Judeo-Christian faith and practice with Arabian beliefs and also many Gnostic beliefs. And I'm working on a book, what's called the Book of al Qasai, from a group called the al Qasites, and of course Mani of Manichaeism fame, of Manichaeism fame, which seemed to be an integral part of Islamic faith and practice. Pardon me. Now I'm going to go through some of the various scholars and notes taken from the Sharia and from the Encyclopedia of Islam on discussions on Gnosticism again. So, Dul-Nun was the first to teach the true nature of Gnosis, or Marifa as it is called in Islam, in Arabic, which he describes as knowledge of the attributes of the unity. That's the unity being the monad, this this would actually, the concept of the Islamic Tawhid, of Allah being one, uh, actually lines up very well with the idea of the monad, as well as with the Neoplatonic view from Plotinus of the one. They're actually, they're a perfect match. So they're like hand in glove. So there, there's a, there are many, many precursors to the concepts of Allah and various other Islamic teachings and practices. And this belongs to the saints, those who contemplate the face of Allah within their hearts. So, and they mention here again, the Gnostics. So they are copious, and I've been through this in the past with on the show. They are numerous, numerous, endless, especially within Islamic law, within the Sharia, Gnosticism, 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 Gnostics, constantly. And in Islam, you have a concept called Kashif. In mysticism, the act of lifting and tearing away the veil, which comes between man and the extra phenomenal world. Islam is filled with such references to mysticism and ritual occult magic. There's even a very famous book called the Kashif al Mahjub, the oldest Persian treatise on Sufism. And now let's have a look at this man called, well, this thing called Baphomet. This is the most popular presentation of Baphomet. This obviously was a 16th or 17th century representation of Baphomet that became popular. However, at certain times it was just a head or it was just different representations, but this is what we, what people think of when they see. And of course, this was the depiction of Baphomet created by Oliphas Levi. Now Baphomet is considered to be the devil, the, the Mendes goat and so on. There's numerous ideas but let's look at how Islam is connected to this. I'm going to talk about the Templars and there's going to be some controversy because people have had a certain narrative about the Templars given to them over many years. The Templars were heroes, the Templars were great, the Templars were amazing. 
and the Catholic Church was evil, and the Catholic Church destroyed the Templars, and the Catholic Church took their money, the bad, bad, bad Roman Catholic Church. Catholics are evil. Templars are amazing. Templars are awesome. And, um, and of course, Jews are evil for, for doing usury, and the Jews are evil for, for having banks, and the Jews are evil for, for being money lenders and, and controlling the money. And of course, before the Jews were those money lenders that everyone loves to hate so much, guess who had that role in Europe? Who were the people lending money? Who were the people controlling the purse strings? Who were the people playing with the financial strings in the background? Well, the Templars. But Lloyd, it's okay when the Templars do it because we're hypocrites. Yes, you are. You are. Exactly. Not only that, you're ignorant too because maybe people just have certainly followed with certain agenda to simply apply hatred and bigotry without thinking. Now, do understand, I, I do tend to use a little bit of sarcasm because I, I find that rational debate doesn't always work that well with people who are A, uneducated or B, just simply have had their minds filled with, with poison. So, understand... The Templars were heroes at one time. The Templars degenerated. The Templars, as the evidence shows, and from... Now, here's the thing is, you've been given a set of facts that says that the Templars are A, B, and C, and that's wonderful, just just amazing. Walked on water, you know, they, they just they just produce puppies out of hats and, and, and wonderful, wonderful guys, right? However, this is only one side of the story. There's another side of the story with a completely historical set of facts historians that have written lots of things and for some reason the narrative the focus has only been on this the set of facts there's another set of facts a lot uglier a lot darker a lot nastier and this is where i'm going to be looking right we've we've all covered this we've all heard this we've all believed this but there are other things and and of course there are those who are going to say well lloyd we don't like those facts let's ignore them i'm going to say no let's not they're just as historical as the others and in fact maybe maybe they are more relevant so modern scholars agree that the name of Baphomet was an old French corruption of the name Mahomet, with the interpretation being that some of the Templars, through their long military occupation of the Middle East, had begun incorporating Islamic ideas. Now you will find many references that, that state Sufi ideas, specifically Sufi Islamic ideas, into their belief system, and that this was seen and documented by the Inquisitors as heresy. Now there's lots of propaganda that's been said about this, some of it's true, some of it's not. A lot of it's just, you know, uh, but it takes a lot of digging. By up to 1928, something like 2,000 books had been written about the Templars, just up to 1928. So imagine how many there are by now and what you've got to dig through to try and find the actual truth. Now, in another source, okay, by this Frenchman written before 1235, he speaks of, in this source, a Saracen. And these were, the Saracens are, are Muslims. Right? And he says that the Sarasan idol is called the Baphomet. And Baphomet is Mahomet, the prophet of Islam. Another chronicler historian of the First Crusade, Raymond of Aguilla, he called mosques Bafumarias. Right, so Baphomet, before he became popularly associated with Satan, which is a very late development, I think in the 1800s, a 19th century development, the idea of the Baphomet was associated with Islam and Muhammad. Now you've got this guy, Peter Partner. This is one reference from a book. He states in his 97 book, The Knights Templar and Their Myth, in the trial of the Templars, one of their main charges was their supposed worship of a heathen idol head known as a Baphomet. Notice idol head, right? Not an entire image of this nature, but just notice you've got the crescent moon and the star. This is the Islamic symbol, the crescent moon and the star. Right, just something to bear in mind. There's, so there's, there's that little odd overlap there. Don't forget, so I was saying, the Baphomet is Muhammad. Now there's lots to be said about this. I'm busy working on some other notes on this in much more depth, so I will come back to this in the future. Now, St. John of Damascus wrote a critique of Islam, and he spoke of the Saracens, which is derived from the term Saras Kenoi, or the destitute of Sarah. Right, Because what Agar, or Hagar said to the angel, Sarah hath sent me away destitute. So don't forget, Hagar had Ishmael, and he's supposed to be on the line of Muhammad. They produced the Muslims. They, these used to be idolaters, and they worshipped the morning star and Aphrodite, Alilat. Right? So they worshipped the morning star. In their own language, they called this Hebar. 
I've actually been there. It's called Khubr. I've been to Saudi Arabia a few times, which means the great, the Kabirun, great in size or dignity. And Sozomen also says they were descended from Hagar, but they called themselves descendants of Sarah to hide their servile origins. So the Saracens, the Muslims, right? And I will move on from that point. Uh, this slide is very much unfinished. And ah, I just want to mention, so I'm still busy working on this particular slide. I've added this in, but I still have to go and back and do some additional work with this. To understand the truth, we have to unravel the surprising history of Baphomet itself. Despite popular misconceptions, Baphomet had no association with Satan until well into the ah, 20th century. 20th century. The word first turned up in a letter of 1098 written by an Anselm, Anselm of Ribabont who fought in the First Crusade. Describing the lead-up to a clash with Muslim soldiers, he wrote how as the next day dawned, they called loudly upon Baphomet, and we prayed silently in our hearts to God. The context of the word here, along with other evidence from the First Crusade, suggests heavily that Baphomet was simply a corrupted version of Mahomet, an old French word referring to Muhammad, the founder of Islam. So I'll pause there for a moment. Do you have anything to add or any comments, Harry? Um, just uh, to say thank you. It's very, very interesting. Uh, if you don't mind, I will see if we have any questions or you want to continue. I'll take any questions. Okay, so guys, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. No, nothing so far. Right, so there are other references from the 12th and 13th century where people called loudly upon Baphomet. Okay. And so I'm not going to go into this because I haven't read this slide because I said it's new, so I just dumped it in here uh, because it's work that I need to need to uh, continue. But uh, let me see. So I'm going to skip this because that, that actually goes into depth that I'm not actually keen to get into right now. Now, Baphomet. Now, this is from the Oxford English Dictionary. I've never heard of it. That Who knows if it's important? We never know. You know, can't be relevant at all. But this Oxford English Dictionary does say that Baphomet... Right, is a form of the name Muhammad, used by medieval writers. It is the alleged name of the idol which the Templars were accused of worshipping. And the great stress in the condemnation of the Templars is laid on the worship of Baphomet. Now, here's where someone's going to say, but Lloyd, but Lloyd, it's those evil Roman Catholics who just wanted to steal the money of the Templars. And, um, and it was good for the Templars to have that money because we hate the Jews for it, but you know, the Templars are all goody two-shoes and it's okay when they do it. And um, interestingly, it was just a matter of time until the Templars were taken down because the Templars had, and, and if you look through some of the histories, right, if you look through, when you look through certain historical scholars, they are guilty of deifying, of, of, of lauding the Templars as if they walked on water. They turned them into these great men, this, these heroes of the age, these shining knights. But the Templars had actually, if you read some of the other histories, you read some of the other scholars who talk about the Templars, the Templars had actually become disliked, hated even. So after the Crusades, they made a lot of wealth. Remember, they swore a vow of poverty, but they somehow became filthy rich, and they started lending this money to governments, and they started to control things because they controlled the purse strings. And um, they were like the, uh, who do people dislike today? Oh, the Rothschilds, the bankers. They were the Rothschilds of the day. Okay, so, so please make up your mind. If, if being a Rothschild is good, if being a Rothschild is bad. If, if the Templars doing the same thing is bad or good, take your pick. Uh, but they were despised by, by many, many people for breaking their vows. But also there were many incidents and many rumors. And it's not incidences, right? It's incidents. There were many incidents and rumors and many occasions where it was recorded and known that the Templars had sided with the enemy. They'd sided with the Muslims. They'd collaborated as traitors. They'd collaborated with the Muslims against the local rulers, against their own people. So all of these incidents, all of this had started to accumulate and resentment and dislike and even hatred had built up against the Templars. They'd gotten dirty. And it was just a matter of time. They were going to be absorbed, I think, into the Order of St. John, the hospital is. So it was just a matter of time. And, I, and from what I know, their wealth was actually transferred into St. John. Right. Now, certainly, so the French king eventually did take them down. Now, the, the Pope actually was against this. But eventually, the Pope decided to go along with this. And, of course, everyone, you're going to say what you like about the Pope. I'm not a Catholic. I don't have a dog in this fight. But I just, you know, uh, there's always more sides to the story. And I'm not interested in the propaganda. Because there are more facts that 
if you're going to tell me one thing, you're going to be leaving out other facts. And we all know what the one side is. I'm interested in the other side that everyone has been leaving out. Okay, right. I'm going to move on from this point here. Now, notice in Leviticus 17, we actually have this interesting phrase here. They must no longer offer any of their sacrifices to the goat idols to whom they prostitute themselves. This is to be a lasting ordinance for them and for the generations to come. That's Leviticus 17, 7. That's one of the laws that God gives to the Israelites. And Baphomet is a goat idol. So in this case, we're seeing an example of antinomianism, which is against the law, going against the law of God. So for some reason, they decided it was good to go against the, the law of God, against the law of the Bible. This would place them firmly into the Gnostic category for, for many reasons. Now, Friedrich Nikolai, now, interesting point. So now you've got different scholars that debate different things on different sides of this issue. 1733 to 1811, he questioned the authenticity of the Templar legend and the role of the historical knights Templar. In his Versuch über die Beschuldigungen, welche dem Tempel Herrn Orden gemacht worden und über dessen Geheimnis, bla bla, yada yada, whatever, he says, Nikolai argued against the identification of the mysterious Baphometus or Baphomet and Mahomet which implied that the Knights Templar had secretly been converted to Islam and were worshipping a kind of Muslim idol. Instead, he was convinced of the Gnostic beliefs of the Knights Templar, which is fascinating because Islam explicitly claims no ambiguity, black and white, states it is a Gnostic religion, that its scholars are Gnostic. And in explicitly, as I showed in the beginning, I showed you those, that whole bunch of YouTube videos where the Muslim scholars are claiming that they are Gnostics, so there you go. The Muslims don't hide the fact that their major scholars, their senior scholars, are Gnostics, that Islam is a Gnostic religion. So he was convinced of the Gnostics. So this is, from, this is jumping from the frying pan into the fire. It's the same thing. Islam, Gnosticism, same thing. It's just Islamic Gnosticism. Now, speaking of a Kabbalistic Gnostic philosophy, well, Kabbalistic Gnostic philosophy, he explained that Gnosticism had emerged from Kabbalah and represented an erroneous heretical strand that was taken up by the Templars. So now he says the Templars became Gnostics. Well, they can certainly be Sufis who are Islamic Gnostics. So, now let's have a look at the Encyclopedia of Occultism, right? And let's see what it says. This is from a place called Harvard. Never heard of it. Can't be important, but who knows? Let's see what they say. So a little bit of depth here. But Baphomet, the goat idol of the Templars, right? The name is composed of three abbreviations, Tem, blah, 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 the father of the temple of universal peace among men, blah, blah, blah. And they speak of Baphomet, a monstrous head. Others that it was a demon in the form of a goat. An account of a veritable Baphometic idol is as follows, a pantheistic and magical figure of the absolute. So, of course, the Tawhid, Allah, the monad, would be an absolute, right? There's no division within it. So, Right? Narratives of sorcery and magic, writing on the Baphomet, says another charge in the accusation of the Templars seems to have been to a great degree proved by the deposition of witnesses. Now, people are going to say, but the Templars were tortured to get these. Well, there were thousands of Templars. Not all of them were tortured. There were places where they were not tortured, where evidence all over Europe, where evidence was forthcoming, which matched the evidence of people in countries that were separated from them. So the evidence actually lines up. Some of them were treated well, and they simply gave oral evidence, which said the very same things. Now, this is not to say that every Templar was necessarily involved in the cult. It looks like the leadership certainly was, and certain of their followers. However, there's lots of evidence that was not gained on the torture. Right. And of course, what happens is you've got conspiracy theorists and I'll, I'll, let's, let's use it in the pejorative conspiracy theorists who have a particular agenda, who simply like one side of the argument, hate the Roman Catholics and want to blame them for everything and then state that, oh, yeah, they were tortured without going to looking deeper into the evidence and looking at scholars, historical scholars who also looked into this and provide additional evidence and expand on the narrative and show that there's there's actually more to this than just this one sided agenda. Right. So let's have a look. So many Templars confessed having seen this idol. Okay. Some describe it differently, but that's just the case with history. Some of the knights from the south added another circumstance in their confession relating to this head. They were told that they must adore this head. This head is your God and your Muhammad. Interesting. And now they speak of this figure of Baphomet 
and that he worshipped it by kissing its feet and exclaiming Allah. That's a typo. If you, you'll find the same thing elsewhere, it just says Allah. So the same reference recurs in this book. That's just a typo. Allah, which he describes as a word of the Saracens, the Saracens being the Muslims. Now this has been seized upon by some that the Templars had secretly embraced Mohammedanism as Baphomet, or Baphomet is evidently a corruption of Muhammad. Okay? Now, von Hammer gave a Greek derivation of the word and assumed it as proof that Gnosticism was the secret doctrine of the Temple. Oh, no, they're not Muslims, they're Gnostics. No, well, it's simple. They're Muslim Gnostics. They're Islamic Gnostics. They were Sufis. There's other evidence that I've gathered, things that I've found, references that I've determined state that, that the Templar short version after their major defeats, remember they, they suffered some major defeats, they then felt that they came into contact with a lot of the Sufis. And they somehow felt that the Sufis had a stronger understanding than their basic understanding or that the, the simple understanding of their clerics, right, of the secrets of the universe or the nature of God, whatever it was. And many of them, in fact, one of their gravest enemies, if you remember the slightly ahistorical movie, The, Tem the, the Kingdom of Heaven, love the movie it's a great movie fun movie no, not entirely historic, historically accurate a little bit of propaganda there but still enjoyed the movie a whole lot watched it many times you see that um balian of um wherever he comes from balian fights against um what's the name of the, the muslim guy that he fights the general um oh good grief someone help me out here balian fights against come on the the main character on the other side the enemy muslim the general that he fights for control of jerusalem well yeah. Aladdin. Aladdin. Yes, I think is it Aladdin? I think so. Oh, anyway, that guy, I think he's mentioned in I think I come to a slide with him. That guy was eventually inducted into the Templar order. Okay? But moving on. There's every reason to believe that there was some foundation for the charges of heresy made against the Templars. And it rendered their Christianity not quite so pure as that of Western Europe because you see the Templars were trying to apparently integrate the understanding of the Sufis, which is Islam, into their understanding of Roman Christianity. So according to one source that I've been reading, so the Templars were trying to integrate Islamic ideas with Roman Christian ideas, with the idea obviously they were Roman Christian, they were Roman Catholics, right? Which we would today know as Chrislam right which is um a heresy so understand that if, if you approve of chrislam then you're going to love the templars but of course if you all say chrislam is bad and it's evil and it's well then you can't like the templars so it followed the doctrines and rights of the gnostic ophites of islam oh that comes up again baphomet being merely a corruption of muhammad and they speak of the rejection of christianity in favor of a religion based on gnostic dualism so that's another scholar, Hans Prutz, who mentions this. So clearly the, these Templars were not on the level anymore. Something had changed with them. And expressions as regards the worthiness of Saracen nations among whom the Templars had many friends. So they were making friends with the enemy. That would be known as being traitorous, possibly even treasonous. You know, It is even possible that the Templars introduced into their rites practices which savored of Gnosticism or Mohammedanism. And the correct answer to all of this is, Lord, we need to ignore this and we need to say, oh, the Templars were wonderful, they walked on water and the Catholics were bad. Because that's become the dominant narrative. But maybe we shouldn't ignore the evidence. There's overwhelming evidence that states that the Templars had gone dirty. Okay, now, skipping that. So, any comments or questions from you, Harry? Yeah? Yeah, we have a question from a guy called Nubian World. Yeah. Um, it, it could be interesting, in the Nubian part. Uh, would you like to allow it? Sure. Well, yeah. Nubian, go ahead, please. No, no, I didn't have a question, actually. I was listening to what you were saying. I was just um, touching my thing to let you know that I'm in, in the building, basically. So, uh, no, I'm listening to what you're saying because a lot of what you're talking about is what I'm actually doing a lot of research on at the moment. And um, uh, but it's vital information because uh, what you said about the uh, the Gnostics, though, I'm a bit kind of weary because Gnosticism is more or less based on our version of what we feel the the supreme supremacy of religion is. And as you, you know that you know religion is is controlled by different sources, such as for instance Islam in the East and in in, in the Far East, it's Buddhism. And, oh, sorry, and, sorry, and, and, sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry, I fell asleep there. I was. Um, you said something. 
Sorry, uh, I'm, sorry. I, I'm sorry. Look, I I really don't have I don't have a look. I, I'm really not interested no, in listening. I'm really not interested in listening to religion is about control, you know, because it's really all bad. It's just about control. Man should be free. He should be free to do his own thing. And then, and really, we should all just listen to Karl Marx because you know that that'll set us free, you know, because that's not control. That wh whatever. Look, that is simply a propaganda narrative. Religion is about control. That's a very those are propagandistic, broad-stroke statements meant for the gullible. This, is, this simply tries to paint a very broad brush across things that are vastly different, right? So, unfortunately, if you look at the doctrine of Islam, and you compare that with the doctrine of Christianity, they are vastly different things. There may be similarities, but that doesn't mean that they are the same. You can put lipstick on a shemale that doesn't make it a woman. They might look the same, they're a little bit different, right? So, when you say control, maybe man needs to control his violent instincts. Maybe he needs a, set, a set of moral rules. Maybe, maybe you'll discover that Christianity actually turned Europe into a very, very powerful civilization that actually sufficiently reduced man's violence to allow him to develop the greatest civilization that Earth has ever known. The, more, the wealthiest, most successful group that the earth has ever known. The envy of everyone else who failed to embrace those principles. Now, of course, unfortunately, people are not naturally just good. No, people do need levels of control. There has to be some kind of discipline, some sort of rules, some kind of social contract, right? There needs to be some sort of agreed upon sets of rules that we can all, there needs to be a level of trust. There has to be certain mechanisms within which we can run a larger society. If you're running a village, you know, and you're living on a farm on your own, that's great. That's fantastic. But if you're running a nation, things don't work like that, right? You actually have to be able to trust that there's certain systems in place that are going to work for you and that you have a common identity, common goals, that you have common rules, laws that you understand, and that there's, that things are going to function for you. So um, control of certain things is actually necessary, right? Control of a car is necessary. Control is not a bad thing. So, so really, but when I hear the thing of like, oh, these are all about control. Well, yeah, maybe you've got to control your base impulses. May maybe the fact that mankind controlled some of its base impulses, stopped hitting people over the head and actually started to form societies where there was trust. Maybe that's a good thing. And then, of course, you had people that couldn't control their basic impulses and they started massive wars. And before you get into the story of wars, I've covered this in depth. When you say, well, religion is the cause of the greatest number of wars. Bullshit. Absolute and total bullshit. When you look at the statistics, there's a wonderful book by Philip Axelrod and another guy called the Encyclopedia of Warfare. 93% of all wars in history was by governments, for secular reasons. 7% of wars, I think at most, maximum 7% of wars, have a religious component. That's not to say they are religious wars, but there's a religious component. And fully, more than half more than half of all the wars that have a religious component are the re <laughs> specifically due to Islam. Islam alone has been responsible for more warfare than all other religions combined. Religion has actually reduced man's violence. Islam, of course, has increased man's violence because Islam is inherently violent. I'll leave it at that. Thanks for the talk, but really, I, I, that's propaganda. I'm not interested. Let's take another question, please, or comment. Uh, reclaim the law, sure. and after him, Nathan, please. Sure. One second. Reclaim uh, the law, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, you'll probably shoot me down in flames. Your learning's a lot deeper than mine. But um, as I understand it, the Gnostics had two branches. One was called the Therapeutae, who were inter interested in healing. And the other words are called the Essenes, who are interested in spiritual more research, spiritual teachings. And as I understand it, Christ himself, when he disappeared at the age of 13 and didn't reappear till 30 odd, started performing miracles, he was studying, those of the elders of the temple that he was studying with, he studied with both branches. Now, it's very interesting to me when you say the Gnostics, and being that Muslims and Gnostic, or Islam is a Gnostic uh, religion. Well, as I understand it, Gnostic means to experience God. By direct to have, to have a, to have had a direct experience, to know by by experience rather than by teaching, and I'm very interested in that angle, the Sufis included. Mulla Nasruddin. I mean, I'm fascinated by all that subject. 
but just the, uh, the the bridge between Christianity and Islam could be the Gnostics. More Gnostics, I think. Gnosticism, from a Christian point of view, is anti-Christian. It is entirely anti-Christian. It is antinomian. It's against the law of God. It entirely views the God of Christianity as the evil God, as the demiurge, one who attacked the good God, harmed him, and brought darkness and evil into the world and created the evil world of matter. Uh, when you mentioned the Essenes, and sorry, you, there's a lot that you need to really get to grips with. There's so much more to that. I've got other shows that have discussed this in, in depth and at length, uh, but no, that's, uh, no, I, I'm afraid I, I can't agree with that. Maybe they, look, I mean, Hitler did nice things. He was a vegetarian and he started an eight hour work day. And I mean, maybe we shouldn't think of him as a monster because, hey, look, he built roads. What a wonderful guy. Eight hour work day. That's great stuff for people. He uh, promoted families. Fantastic guy. Can we stop seeing him as a monster now? Well, uh, there's another side to Gnosticism that uh, maybe, may, may, maybe you don't want to drink that poison. So uh, moving on. Right. Kabbalah. Yeah. Uh, one second. Yep. Just the last question, please. Uh, sure, Nathan, sure. Can you go ahead? Nathan? Wait, could you hear me? Could you hear me now? Yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah. We can okay. hear you. It's actually, I want to make it short because I really want to hear this and the, the slide looks super interesting. Um, but I've been um, looking specifically at, um, so I, want, I wanted to know about uh, Baphomet and Muhammad, um, how, um, you analyze sort of what's the chicken and what's the egg, like what came first. And it may be obvious because the scholars say that um, Baphomet came from Muhammad, but it might, there might have been um, something before um, Muhammad. So what I'm getting at is how do you analyze kind of the root of the word? And this ties into Kabbalah, of course, because it's, um, it's about the root of the word. As I said, the first historical reference to this word dates to, I think, the 11th century or the 10th century, 11th century. So that is where that originated. And overwhelmingly, it shows that this is related to the time of the Crusades and the Muslims using the term Baphomet to describe Muhammad, or it is a misunderstanding, but it seems to be too consistent. I mean, look, anything could have been anything. I mean, you know, people might have just misunderstood and and you know, maybe something was actually something else. And maybe we can think of a million different reasons. Like, you know, maybe the wheel isn't supposed to be round. Maybe it was actually, you know, maybe maybe the wheel was actually hexagonal. And then what happened was, you know, people came along and just misunderstood the idea that maybe the wheel that's supposed to be like four sided. And it's just, or maybe it is what it is. Thank you. Sure. Um, Let's continue. Yeah, so Kabbalah is Islamic. Well, that's the name of the slide. So Kabbalah, Jewish mystic philosophy from the 1520s, right? Also Kabbalah from medieval Latin Kabbalah, from Mishnaic Hebrew Kabbalah, reception, received law, tradition, especially the tradition of mystical interpretation of the Old Testament from Kibble to receive, to admit, to accept. Now, I think we would have to make a distinction between Jewish Merkava mysticism and Kabbalah. So this is taken from the online etymological dictionary, online etymology dictionary. Okay. And if you go to Kabbalah to etymoline, it actually has a secondary entry here and it states compare Arabic Kabbalah, because we do have the Kaaba in Islam and this is Kabbalah. He received accepted. Of course, Islam is about submission, right? Every Muslim has to accept what comes from Muhammad, what comes from Allah, and submit to it, right? So submission to what you receive. And hence, any secret or esoteric science in Islam, we've discussed again in the past in depth, that Islam is about secret or esoteric sciences, which are an integral part. Every esoteric aspect of Islam is called the ilm, the science. Right? And in fact, the science, if you go through the history, they've always been called the, the sciences in Islam before before we had what we call the rational sciences of today, what we consider science today in the Western world, science was the occult within Islam, the ilm. Right. So there was always this connotation that the sciences, and in fact the scholars do write, and I have covered in the past, that all of the sciences were esoteric, occult, mystical, spiritual sciences, 
and that the secondary sciences, like what we call the practical sciences, uh, as they call in Islam, are just uh, are just a, a minor offshoot. The important things are the spiritual occult sciences, only available to the elite within Islam, the Gnostic Sufi elite. Right. So, but they do speak of it as the the point is that there is an Arabic Kabbalah. Now, this is not discussed because it's not known, it's not investigated. What is the Arabic Kabbalah? Is the Arabic Kabbalah prior to the Jewish mystic Kabbalah, which they state here dates from the 1520s? Now, we can go back to Merkava mysticism, which dates to a much earlier period, of course. But what Arabic Kabbalah is this that, to my knowledge, is even older? Right. Uh, short version, Muslim Templar Knights. Now, Islam is entirely anti-Christian. It is antithetical to Christianity and Western concepts of law and morality. But now, this is, um, yeah, these guys claim to be a genuine continuation of the, the surviving remnants and fragments of the Templars. And they've resurrected this Templar order. They've got a website. They discuss in detail. There's quite a lot to read there. And they speak that the modern order of the Temple of Solomon honors the Treaty of Ramallah of 1192 AD. It reconfirmed by the Treaty of Acre in 1229, establishing peace and cooperation between the Knights Templar and the Muslim Saracen Knights of Arabian chivalry to defend all faith of all religions, which is total hogwash. Uh, we did the episode uh, a couple of weeks ago discussing the Islamic doctrines of deceit, the Islamic doctrines of deception and lying. Islam has detailed, detailed doctrines, entire books, entire chapters within the Sharia on how to lie who to lie to, when to lie. And in fact, as a standing order, lying is obligatory upon Muslims. Deceit is obligatory upon Muslims. And they should always use deception as a safety precaution. They should always utilize a level of deception as a precaution, as a precautionary measure. This is the Islamic law. Right, so we discussed that in depth. I went into serious depth in that recently. I discussed the different forms of deception, just like like, like the Eskimos um, have multiple words for snow. Islam has numerous words for lying, for different kinds of lying, different ways of lying, different methods of lying. And uh, this is explicitly discussed within their Islamic law. And I did that two weeks ago. So no, Islam abrogates all other religions. I've discussed this as well in depth. Islam abrogates all religions. All following religions are null and void after the arrival of Islam. Christianity, Judaism are all deen al-batl, right? The void religions, the worthless religions. Al-batl means worthless, void, null, cancelled. But also it is one of the names of Satan, al-batl. One of the names of Satan, so Judaism and Christianity are the religions of Satan. Islam then becomes the deen al-haq, right? The religion of truth which has extensive doctrines of lying. So, yeah. So the historical record, blah, 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 proves that the Templar order was never against Islam as religion. They were never against Islam as religion. Tell that to ISIS, right? That, that we're all friends and why can't we just get along? Muslims were in fact admitted to membership in the Templar order as an exception. And the Sultan Salah Adin, that's the guy's name, Salah Adin, himself was given the Templar knighting ceremony near Alexandria. What is interesting is that Alexandria is the home of numerous heresies that plagued the church in the first four or five hundred years of church history. Alexandria was a hotbed of Gnostic and pagan and all sorts of heretical ideas that ultimately just seriously plagued the church. And the modern order, the Temple of Solomon, honors blah, blah, blah. And it says here, so again, that's just a repetition of what you see down there, just a larger form of that. So the Muslim Templars, right? Is this just subversion? So the Knights of the Order of Salah Hadin, official heraldic coat of the arms of the Knights of the Order of Salah Hadin, recognized by and participating in the Templar Order under the Treaty of Ramallah, 1192. So they actually invited Muslims into their order, according to this history that's given here. So, yeah, they say that they, they actually started to fraternize, befriend, and eventually allied with the enemy. This would make them traitors. Right. Sedition is when you try to undermine your own government from inside. But traitorship, where you become a traitor, treason, is when you align with external enemies of the state. And that is what they did. And this is one of the reasons the Templars were taken down, because they started to, instead of fighting the enemy, they started sleeping with them, metaphorically or maybe literally. Who knows? Uh, any comments from you before I go on, uh, Harry? No, please continue. 
So, uh, contrary to popularized misconceptions, the Templars fully understood that Muslims were not necessarily enemies, that the real enemies of Christ could be even evildoers pretending to be Christians, and that the enemies of Christ were generally the same as the enemies of Islam. This is complete hogwash. It is propaganda, and these people are either dishonest or they've misled. They've been misled. They've been deceived, and they are buying into a lie. So, we need to see. We've discussed this at length again, in terms of the the how Islam and Christianity are set apart, how they are set against each other within their doctrines, within their fundamental doctrines. And Islam has to subjugate the whole world. Islam has to destroy Christianity. And ultimately, Jesus, as a Muslim, will come back, worship behind Muhammad. But before that, he will kill the Jews, destroy the churches, kill any Christians that oppose him, convert everybody to Islam, and then the world will be at peace as Muslims. So, indeed, evildoers are essentially the enemies of all faith, opposed to the principle of religion itself, and are thus the enemies of God. Therefore, the Templars were never crusaders against Muslims and did not agree with any such philosophy. Rather, the Knights Templar were holy warrior monks fighting for good against evil, regardless of which religions may or may not be involved. And, yeah, so, propaganda, or worse. Okay, just so you know, the, the Catholic Church has written more papal bulls against Freemasonry than anything else. The Catholic Church was dead set historically against Freemasonry. They called it heresy. They called it evil. They called it subversion. So there's numerous of these papal balls. This is one of them. We wish it to be your rule, first of all, to tear away the mask from Freemasonry and to let it be seen as it really is, and by sermons and pastoral letters to instruct people as to the artifices used by societies of this kind in seducing men and enticing them into their ranks and as to the depravity of their opinions and the wickedness of their acts. As our predecessors have many times repeated, let no man think that he may for any reason join the Masonic sect if he values his Catholic name and his eternal salvation as he ought to value them. Let no one be deceived by a pretense of honesty. It may seem to some that Freemasons demand nothing that is openly contrary to religion and morality. But as the whole principle and object of the sect lies in what is vicious and criminal, to join with these men or in any way to help them cannot be lawful. Pope Leo XIII. Numerous other popes have similar encyclicals and similar papal bulls. Given at St. Peter's in Rome, the 20th day of April, 1884, the sixth year of our pontificate. And it states here, the irreconcilability between, between Christian faith and Freemasonry, let us remember that Christianity and Freemasonry are essentially irreconcilable. So that enrollment in one means separation from the other. In other words, when a Roman Catholic joins the Freemason, that excommunicates him. He's no longer a member of the Catholic Church. He's no longer a Christian. He has been thrown out of the Church. So, understand, no. So, Freemasonry, and Freemasonry is Gnostic, is not reconcilable with Christianity, and therefore, Gnosticism is not a bridge between Islam and Christianity. Gnosticism stood against Christianity for hundreds of years. It was the main enemy, and I actually did the discussion on that on this channel already. Gnosticism stood against the Christian faith as a contradiction of the Christian faith of Christian doctrine. It rewrote all of the Christian stories as myth. And um, yeah, and if Gnosticism is true, which is fantastic, then uh, we should be able to, I don't know, do archaeology with their books. And I'm afraid that's not happening. And it's never happened. It's never going to happen. Just as we cannot do archaeology with the Quran. Whereas the Bible is constantly utilized, Old Testament and New, for archaeological purposes, to either find things or to identify things that have been found. Right, and to lead to further discoveries because there actually is historicity within the Bible. So, yeah, from an archaeological point of view. right? Now, some Gnostic connections. In France, these polemics were adopted in several conspiracy theories, most prominently by the anti-Masonic Jesuit Augustine Barruel, 1741-1820, in his I Do Not Speak French, Mémoire pour servir à l'histoire de la de Jacobisme, from 1797. Barrowell maintained that the French Revolution had been the outcome of a Masonic plot, a conspiracy, whose ideology he traced back to the Kabbalistic Freemasons, the Templars, the Cathars, the Gnostics, and eventually the Manichaeans. What should be noted is that Mani, who formed the Manichaean Gnostic sect, he was, at four years old, a member of a sect which his father joined. Um, he had joined a man called al Qasai. These guys were Gnostics. They had a religion which was derived from, based upon, mimicked, camouflaged itself as Christian, but was anti-Christian. 
but was entirely against Christian, based on myth again, just like many other Gnostic sects. And Manny took many, many of these ideas and explicitly discusses this um, al qasai religion with the al qasites within his own books. In fact, Mani mentions the, um, the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, I think, 72 times within his own writings. So, obviously, he has stolen from these Gnostic Gospels, right? What is interesting is that the, the Alkasites were also known as the Katharoi, the pure. And the Cathars, these guys here, take the name from the Katharoi, which are the group that Mani took his, plagiarized his knowledge from, his secret Gnostic knowledge from. So they're all Gnostics. So it's very, very interesting that you've got many, many references to the Freemasons becoming Gnostic. Now, when they say Kabbalistic, do they mean the Islamic Kabbalah or the Jewish Kabbalah? That's, that's an interesting question that needs to be examined in more depth. Now, let's continue. The Sufis. Now, let's look at Idris Shah. Known Sufi, complete criminal, actually interesting guy when you read about his life. Now, Robert Graves writes on page 202-212 of the introduction in this book here, The Sufis by Idris Shah. This is Idris Shah here. Okay. Um, okay, the first edition, the definitive work on a mystical teaching and a way of life that have had enormous impact on both the East and the West. When they say enormous impact, do they mean a negative impact or a positive impact? I'd say the impact is incredibly negative, but yeah. So, now of course, um, those who will have to push their particular agenda, they're just a one-sided agenda, Catholic Church bad, white people bad, and so on, and uh, Jews bad, of course, they... they, so they just want to blame those groups because that's the acceptable politically acceptable groups that one's allowed to hate or maybe they are i don't know shoals for islam you never know they might just be shoals for islam they could be uneducated hopefully they'll learn something from this but the sufis the sufis were fortunate enough to protect themselves against the charges of heresy by the efforts of al-ghazali which is actually an interesting interesting history because al-ghazali was himself a sufi fascinating stuff Al-Ghazali was himself a Sufi and a Gnostic, and I've mentioned before, actually, let, let me bring up um, something, give me a moment, to, let me actually bring up something by our good uh, Al-Ghazali, because we should not believe everything we read, so, um, so let us look up this here, I want to bring this up. So, this is the Mishkat al-Anwar by al-Ghazali, the guy who persecuted the Sufis, who was himself a Sufi. A fascinating story. A little sob story just to make your heart cry, make you bleed. Because, oh my God, these poor Sufis. Oh my God. Yeah, whatever. Maybe it's not true. So, let's have a look. Al-Ghazali is the number one Muslim. He's the most highly respected scholar, the most highly titled scholar in Islam after Muhammad himself. Below him are four scholars known as the Mujtahids Mutlaq. The Mujtahid Mutlaq is the infallible scholar. Technically, it's the absolute scholars, those with absolute knowledge of the Sharia, of the law of Muhammad. They are the absolute masters of the application of the Sharia, the law of Muhammad and Allah, applied in human life and made law and political system as a legal and political system. And I'm talking about a proper legal system. Like you have laws in courts on the books, Islam has a legal system, a full legal system. And these scholars were the absolute scholars who applied and taught and defined how to do this. The only scholar above them, besides Muhammad, is Al-Ghazali, known as the proof of Islam, the Hujjat al-Islam. So he was the highest ranking Muslim who understood and applied and gave the context to how to apply the teachings of Muhammad and Allah from the Quran and the Hadith. Right. So, and then below them are the 27 or 28 or 29, depending on what list you consult, of the Sheikh al-Islam, the major scholars of Islam, the single most influential scholars in Islam, after Ghazali, the four scholars who founded the schools of jurisprudence, right, Hanafi, Hanbali, Maliki, and Shafi, and then below that you've got these 29 um, Sheikh al-Islam, the most influential scholars, so you've got these 29, 20 plus 5, it's 34 scholars, roughly, that are the most influential in the last 1400 years of Islam, right? So this is the single most important scholar, the most detailed, the most thorough, the most prolific scholar in Islam after Muhammad. Let's see what this guy says. Let's see what this Sufi says to us. He writes here in this book, and the translator of this book is herself a Sufi. And I'm assuming they chose their words carefully, but let's see what she says. He says that there are those who stopped short of complete illumination and identified, this is garbage, it's hard to read, with al-Muttal, Allah, right? 
And But he says here that unfortunately there's so much in what's going on in this understanding of Islam that is obscure, too difficult for most minds because most Muslim minds are just too small. Our minds are too small, right? But he says that the Sufis, the perfect Illuminati, perceived that... Uh, so this guy, the Sufi, calls the Sufis the perfect Illuminati. I wonder if that's an accident. Oh wait, hold on, hold on. It would be Islamophobic to think that. We can only blame Jews and the Roman Catholics for this. We cannot absolutely, positively not blame Islam. Also, he's brown. We, that would be racist. Or maybe when he says that he calls the Sufis the Illuminati, maybe what he means is they are the Illuminati. Because they obviously worship, they follow a practice called the the light mysticism, the light religion. Um, Satan within Christianity is of course the light bringer. So you've got here the perfect Illuminati, right? So because they are the illuminated and you have so, you know, you have the luminant Allah and you have the illuminated. And of course, Muhammad was the perfect man, the insan al kamal the Qutb. And it's the purpose of the Sufis to use these ritual practices I alluded to earlier to become perfect like Muhammad and achieve perfection, to free their See, within Islam, just as in Gnosticism, the world of matter is evil. Uh, the Sharia, the Islamic law, states that the world is cursed, that all things in the world is cursed, except for dhikr, which is the memory of Allah. But that's a euphemism. It's a very empty term. What it actually means is ritual practices which produce altered states. I actually did a show on this last night in my YouTube channel. So they practice dhikr, which involves breathing, which involves altered states, and in fact involves hypnosis, right? So these practices involve self-hypnosis, going into trance state, separating your mind, and then freeing your soul, this little shard of light that fell into this matter, and freeing that and returning it to the realm of purity, the realm of matter, sorry, the realm outside of matter, the pleroma, the fullness, and so on, which is a very, very Gnostic concept. Okay, so going on. <clears throat> so yeah, let's take anything he says with a grain of salt, but a Sufi who became the highest doctrinal authority in Islam and reconciled Quranic religious myth with rationalistic philosophy, thus earning the title The Proof of Islam. Sufis were the victims of pogroms in less enlightened regions and were forced to adopt secret passwords, groups, and other ruses to protect themselves, just like the uh, Freemasons. The Sufis are an ancient spiritual Freemasonry, he writes. Indeed, Freemasonry itself began as a Sufi society. It first reached England in the reign of King Athelstan. I had someone distract and say, why King Athelstan? What, this is just irrelevant, blah, 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 went on about this. Obviously, it's not a relevant piece of information. It just gives you an anchor in history, just a period. It's got nothing to do with this person was just distracting to deflect away from the fact that the Sufis claim to be the originators of Freemasonry. And Freemasonry was introduced into Scotland disguised as a craft guild at the beginning of the 14th century, doubtless by the Knights Templar, who had become Sufis and were now spreading this Freemason idea that the Sufis hold. So, yeah, also, of course, the Sufis introduced Freemasonry into England. I don't know if I have the reference here, but in fact, there's an interesting reference within this, within these notes from Idris Shah and his, his companions that states that in the 1700s or something, a bunch of Protestant clerics or Protestant students or just Protestant sages, he called them, just Protestant sages. So they may be clerics, they may not be clerics. But these unenlightened idiots, these intellectual midgets, what they did was they discovered Templar writings in, in an old Templar church and it was in Arabic script. It was the Sufi writings on Freemasonry and occult magic and ritual magic. And these unenlightened midgets thinking didn't know that this Arabic script was Islamic Arabic and not Jewish and they said oh this is Hebrew and it's the Jews and he says that these fools basically then started to blame all of this stuff on the Jews when it was actually Arabic script they had in their hands Muslim scripts so yeah that's an interesting point that he makes um, I'm gonna skip over this and I'll pause there for you um, Harry um, um, let's see if we have any questions Guys, raise your hand if you have a question or comment. One second, it's all the time disappearing. Yeah. Dave, go ahead, please. 
Dave? So I just had one observation and a, and a, a link in. Uh, communist newspaper also called the Morning Star. Interesting. Communism started as a as a philosophy. It's actually not a political system, nor is it a system of government. It was actually under Marx. It was it was a form of philosophy. There's a name for it. Um, country it escapes me right now, but it's actually a, a whole philosophy. Yeah, which is very interesting. The Morning Star would refer to uh, uh, to the. I mentioned the star earlier. The um, the the goddess. Yeah, so. Yeah, it's also interesting to see that uh, the, Illumin the Bavarian Illuminati started on the 1st of May. And uh, also the 1st of May is a very important date for the communists. It's, uh, very interesting, yeah. Day. I'm pretty sure if we start digging into Marx and uh, so on, we'll start to find Islamic connections and links that, that have not been found. And in fact, I think it's all been deliberately hidden because the Islamic connections are quite explicit. And yet for some reason, no one talks about it. Um, did, can, can you establish or uh, show us uh, sources or evidence for a connection between Islam and um, the Jesuit order? I haven't found anything like that, to be quite honest. I don't. The thing is, look, people love to hate the Catholic Church, just like as you know. I mean, I, I'm constantly harping on about how people hate the Jews. With with no, they don't need evidence. Evidence is for suckers, apparently. They don't need evidence. They just need to get emotional about it, like little children, right? I, no, like. The Catholic Church, we know the Catholic Church has been infiltrated. I mean, that is without doubt. I have problems with this current Pope. I think the current Pope is not to be trusted. Okay, this guy, I wouldn't trust him as far as I can throw a piano. Um, I would say he's communist, and I would say this man is too... He's the Pope of Islam. This guy is way too anti-Christian and, and Islamic friendly. That, that's... Even and, Catholics. And he's the first Jesuit Pope. Well, yeah, and he's also... And he's the first Pope that's the Pope, while the previous Pope's still alive and not dead. So yeah. he according to uh, Catholic for, sorry for interrupting sure. you but there is a, a very interesting uh, Catholic researcher scholar her name is Anne Bernard Bernard mm -hmm. I can get you the link later she is actually proving that according to Catholic dogma the current pope uh, pope Francis is illegal yeah no I agree illegal. I agree because as far as I know there was a coup and they actually kicked out the previous pope and they installed this guy instead so from what I know from what I've now look, I mean, obviously there's lots of conspiracy theory stuff, and I'm, I'm anti that, as you've you've heard. I just have zero time for that nonsense. I like things that I can document, where I can find corroborating evidence, that you know, multiple corroborating evidence, and so on. But there were three factions within the church, so I believe that within the Jesuits. Now, this is not to paint every single Jesuit as as a raving lunatic, but I would it would seem that within the Jesuits. Uh, from what I've heard from Catholics, proper Catholic historians and guys who seem to know what they're talking about, at least to me, they they state that the Jesuits, there's an element within the Jesuits, within the leadership, that has gone left, seriously left, gone astray, communist left. Now we know, for instance, in the 30s and 40s, the communists planned to infiltrate the Catholic Church and they trained 700 communist priests to do exactly that, right, to corrupt the Catholic Church because they realized they needed to destroy the church from within to weaken European civilization so that they could impose their communism. Now, the, there were two conservative strands within the Catholic Church that unfortunately don't see eye to eye, and they couldn't get together to actually form a coalition to fight against the this, this, Jesu this group within the Jesuits. And the Jesuits just went along, right? Those Jesuits were not part of the inner circle of, of whatever corrupt group is on top. They went along, and these guys had the had the power to sway this whole thing to actually oust the previous pope install their pope and the other two are busy infighting and so they were not able so yeah there's there's certainly issues within the catholic church and the jesuits now there are stories i need to chat to a friend of mine i was hoping to speak to him today in fact he was uh, we missed each other he knows something about this but it's there's a probability i mean there's a historical probability it's hard to prove you can't prove any of it you can only make extrapolations and, and make guesses, right? Hopefully based on some kind of logic and evidence that the Templars weren't entirely... So the Templars were merged into St. John the Hospitalist, right? But some of them escaped, some of them moved to Spain and Portugal, 
and Portugal, and then you start to see links that from Portugal another group appeared, and then the Jesuits appear. So it might seem that 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 this strand of heretics within the the Templar, some of them survived, and they formed new groups. And these groups wanted revenge on the Catholic Church, and they eventually found their way back into the Catholic Church. Now they'd have to do it quietly. They can't come in and just start doing huge things. People would notice, so they need to start small, a little bit here, a little bit there. But down the road, centuries and decades down the road, they've made huge gaps and they've changed the, the, the doctrines and they've corrupted the church from within. It's interesting you mentioned uh, Spain, because if I'm not mistaken, the uh, head of the Jesuit order was a, ge a Spanish general. Uh, he started right. that order. Yeah, so a friend of mine knows something about this, and it's actually interesting. It seems plausible. Again, we, we don't have definitive evidence, but it does seem there's, there's plausibility to it. Yeah, there would, there would be seem... So, it's, look, it's not to say the Jesuits are bad. They probably started off well, but any group can be corrupted, right? And I would say the Catholic Church at this point does have some severe issues. But then again, you know, it's interesting. I, I did a discussion yesterday. People talk, people love to attack the Roman Catholic Church and talk about the pedophilia scandal going on in the Catholic Church. And lots of Protestants do it, right, as a means to demean the church. Now, look, these, these things are illegal. It's not Catholic doctrine. It's a violation of the law. It's a violation of morality, right? And, and these people should be found and punished and hung, right? They deserve it. But if you go into the history of the Protestant Church, you go back to 1990, there are reports that I know of going back to 1990, which state that there's more pedophilia within the Protestant churches than there are within the Catholic Church at this point, right? This is going back to 1990. There's a huge amount of, of sexual child sexual abuse within the Protestant churches, but the Protestants don't want to look there because um, Catholic's bad, right? But when, they start, when you start to look at the statistics and look at the numbers and look at... In 1990, 58% of the... There were two prosecutions a week in America of Catholic... Of priests, sorry, for child sexual abuse. 58% of whom were Protestants. So, so they are not clean. And that, that was 31 years ago. Right? That was 31 years ago. But it's obviously just that all of the evidence is concealed, which, which doesn't fit their narrative. And, and all the evidence... You know, and everything is unchari uncharitably presented against their enemies. And, and that's just how propaganda works. Lloyd, uh, yep. did you find a possible alternative explanation for what happened with the schism in the uh, Catholic Church when they actually had two popes and uh, the, the church? No, I haven't looked at I don't know that much about Catholic doctrine. I haven't looked, I haven't dug that deep into it. I will do it in the future, but uh, Islam and Gnosticism are keeping me very, very busy. I'm trying to do a lot of work on that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Let's go on. Yeah. Okay, so now let's talk about the Ku Klux Klan. Hmm, interesting. So these Knights Templar, interesting that they've got the Knights Templar symbolism here, these Gnostic guys, you know, these Islamic Gnostic dudes. So you, you've all heard of the Ku Klux Klan, the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, who have a holy book <laughs> called the Kloran. Harry, do you know of a, of a book with the name similar to the Chloran? I can't think of any, really. Can't think of I any. Just can't. I don't know. No. David, can you think? Anybody? No. Pink, you know, Prickly? Is there a book that, a holy book called the Chloran? Something like that? Chloran or something. What? Say again, please. The Chloran. The 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 Koran. Oh, why, why didn't I think of that? The Koran. We don't say it here. We don't say it here. Oh, I'm, okay, so the Ku Klux Klan has a holy book called the Koran. Uh, they didn't call it the the Bible. I have no idea why they didn't call their holy book the Bible or the Klibel. They decided to call their book the Koran. And, and let's investigate a little deeper. I mean, because think about it: a group that burns crosses. How Christian are they if they burn the cross? They destroy the cross. That, that's fascinating. Let's have a look. Maybe they're a little bit too in your face. So, the name Quran is derived from the Islamic Quran, the holy book of Muhammad and Islam. The earliest symbol of the KKK was not a cross. Interesting. Uh, what is the symbol of Islam today? What, what is the symbol that Islam uses? Can anyone guess? Please tell me. 
yeah thanks guys yeah the crescent and the star uh nathan wants to speak uh, just just the name uh, come on go ahead nathan yeah i was just gonna say the crescent and the star oh that's cool yeah exactly yeah it's the crescent and the star so let's look at the very first symbol of islam the very no no sorry the very first symbol of the kkk the very first symbol of the kkk was the crescent and the star interesting fascinating stuff so this is the only surviving they've destroyed every other example but up until the early 20th century there was still one surviving uniform by the kkk which was documented these photographs are with the university of tennessee i believe okay the university of tennessee uh did some work documented all this wrote a book about it and um, you can go find it on the university of tennessee and their digital archive their historical archive and here we go let me see that looks like a crescent and a star this is the original kkk clown suit I just want to connect it to today's and uh, guys, can you guess the KKK's uh, originated from which uh, political party in the US? Yes, the, the Democrats. Oh, <laughs> of course, of so course. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, the KKK of Democrats and I mean, Ilan Omar, Rashida Talib, these little jihadis, right? I uh, wonder which party they're with. Hmm, let me think for a moment. So, uh, yeah, the jihad friendly party. So understand the very first symbol until they realized that maybe it was a bad idea and uh, maybe they shouldn't advertise the fact that they're Muslims. The KKK then decided to change its uniform from the crescent and star, right? They changed this symbol, but here's another picture going back, right? This is the original KKK symbol, crescent and star. Inspired by which religion? Hold on, I can't think. Good grief, there's no way. So, this... <laughs> yeah, that, that's the one. <laughs> so, the Islamic KKK symbolism, slide number three. So, now, please understand, this typo was in the original book. I just put it in here faithfully. I know it's a you, okay? I know it's a you. People have... I, I couldn't believe the amount of people losing their tiny little minds over a you. My gosh. I just stuck it in there because the original website just happened to have a typo and I stuck in the typo faithfully so that no one could say, you edited the text. No, I didn't. I just I just did it exactly as it was. OK, so anywho, this here is RJ Brunson, age 82, an original KKK member in Pulaski, Tennessee, an original Klansman wearing an original robe believed to be the only original robe in existence. This picture was taken, I believe, much earlier, maybe 10 years prior, but this booklet, March 24th, 1924. So this KKK member behind the hood at 82 was showing the original robes. So from this in-your-face evidence, it would seem that the KKK took their inspira inspiration and might have been deliberately an offshoot from Islam designed to smear Christianity designed to create a smear right and it's utilizing Islamic ideas so it's a corruption of Christianity another form of Gnosticism or just or just Islamic deceit and in this picture it says here this is likely the same man in the same uniform as above but I'm not absolutely sure this photo was taken near Pulaski Tennessee in 1913 notice I stuck in the U okay for those who want to go on about the U and forget about and try to deflect from the fact that the KKK are Muslims okay good little Muslims Right, the U is back, so so get off my back about that. Now, this is on clanhistory.com, first era clan photos and depictions. All right, and you can find this also at the University of Tennessee archive. Right, and any comments on that before I move on to the last few slides in the next section? I guess you're going to the Shriners now. Um, yeah. I just want I just wanted to say, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm I'm seeing an incredible connection between this shadow religion, which is the Gnostic religion, Islam, and uh, everything that is happening today, it's like, uh, I, I can probably connect it to communism, I cannot prove it, but yes. I, I sense that there is I am a huge pretty sure. Mm. And, and you can see all this postmodernist and uh, polit uh, identity politics and uh, multiculturalism, I think all of that is connected uh, we, uh, you know, relative truth and all that. I think that is that is actually idea. Sufi doctrine. We are all one. We are all the same. That is actually a Sufi doctrine. 
It's not true, but it's one of their doctrines. I mean, they know it's not true, but it's one of their doctrines. We all want the same so thing. Guess, yeah. Yeah. So I guess it would be safe to say that Gnosticism is winning the war. Um, Gnosticism is evil. It, it's the basis of Satanism as well. It would actually form the basis of what we know as Satanism today. I mean, look, there were some of these proto ideas were around, but don't forget it was at the advent of Christianity, which was a massive change. Christianity historical nonsense aside from people have no idea what they're talking about but christianity brought a massive moral and societal philosophical cultural change to the world right brought a massive massive change and these paganism and other, all these other things were reeling from it and the only way that they could gain converts was to adapt and adopt and they started to camouflage themselves with trappings of christianity while still trying to introduce their and retain some of their, their, their evil backwards ideas. So, and that's what they do today. I mean, that's still what to various degrees. And, and Gnosticism is anything if not kleptomaniac friendly. It's, it's, a, it's the religion of kleptomania. It steals ideas and it camouflages itself. Yeah, it, and it adapts and it looks like. So, uh, but yeah, just to answer your question, yes. Sorry, excuse my but, waffle. But it's not only stealing, it's corrupting them. And, yes. And then it's, it's destroying the, the, philosoph the philosophical understanding of the culture, the cultural key of, 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 a, of a certain civilization, especially the West one. It's like infiltrating it and subverting it to something completely different. Western culture is based on Christian ideas, or shall we say Judeo-Christian yes. ideas. Now, it's interesting. I've listened to this one famous podcaster, <laughs> really funny, uh, if you watch some other videos about this guy. But anyway, he says that Ju Judaism and Christianity have so little in common, we should really, I mean, it's like makes as much sense as saying satano Christ christianism you know? So satano Christianity nonsense. Are you talking about this American uh, pastor? No, no, no. I'm talking about an American guy in Italy who wears glasses, but that's another story mm -hmm. for another day. Okay. Anyway, so, um, but yeah, I mean, so from a biblical point of view, we would be referring to biblical Christianity and maybe not necessarily rabbinic, rabbinic Judaism, which has its own issues. Okay, that's, a, that's something I'd need to dive into at some point. Uh, there certainly is some weirdness there. I don't think it's on par with Islam, but that's not to say that some of the people on top may or may not be completely corrupt. That's always possible and maybe not even unlikely. But but from a Judaic point of view, the Talmud versus the Sharia, which are the same thing. The Talmud is the is the exegesis of the of the Torah, the five books of Moses, and um, the Quran is the <laughs> sorry the Sharia is the Talmud of Islam. It's the exegesis of the Quran and the uh, hadith and so on right the, the sunnah of islam so when you compare those two i mean the, the talmud is weird it'll leave your head seriously leave you scratching your head and wondering just what the heck's going on but the talmud is outright sorry the quran is outright evil everything that people accuse the talmud of is explicit within the sharia and most of what people accuse the talmud of is just lies it's just just made up but that's that's a story for another day Okay, now moving on. Islamic Shriners, higher Masons. Now, there's a group of Freemasons above the Masons. All Shriners are Masons. Not all Masons are Shriners. To become a Shriner, you had to go through a high degree of Masonic training for some years, and then you could then go into the initiation rites and become a Shriner. The entry rite apparently has been quite relaxed, so it's a little easier now. It doesn't take as long because they're looking to grab all they can. So they're getting as many people in. But let's have a look at these Islamic Shriners, which is a group of Masons above what we know as the Freemasons. So this Fez here, so a symbol of Ottoman affiliation and adherence to Islam is what the Fez represents. If I go here, you'll notice, let me see. You'll notice that these really, really beautiful Islamic Nazis, and these are Islamo Nazis. What are they wearing? What cap are you seeing, Harry? Uh, a Jewish uh, yarmulke. I'm seeing Jewish yarmulke. Yeah, exactly. So, so they're wearing the red Jewish yarmulke of Morocco, right? So you'll notice this is the same cap. It's an adherence to Islam, and of course these yarmulkes here, okay are yeah these yamukas here all have the death's head on them and the nazi eagle because they are also swearing allegiance that's a nazi salute to the nazis okay 
by swearing allegiance to the Nazi agenda. So this is the Fez. Now the, in Fez, Morocco, in 1033, 6,000 Jews were killed there. There were further massacres in Fez in 1276 and 1465. It is said that the Fez is, was created as a reminder. It's red because of the blood that was spilled, the glorious blood that was spilled in this massacre where the Muslims were able to slaughter their enemies, the Jews. And so this is a reminder of that glorious slaughter and of how Islam is going to slaughter the Jews. So this is where this comes from. And of course, the Shriners are happy to wear it because probably they're just ignorant little boys and they've never read on Google. Who knows? Anyway, so this was adopted as the Shriners' official headgear in 1872. So someone was kind enough to tell me some time ago, which was really hysterically, it was just a phase, you know, it's just kind of a, it's just kind of a thing because it's popular. You know, it's just the thing to do is to, is to adopt all of this whole Eastern paraphernalia. Like, yeah, they've been holding on to it for a long time. They, maybe they should switch over to, I don't know, Buddhist symbols next, but somehow they don't. So yeah, any excuse will do, I guess. So this is another. Now you'll notice this one says Muslim. I wonder what that means. If you wear that on your head, it says Muslim. Ah, who knows? I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm trying, but I can't seem to think. What would it mean if I wear this on my head? And it says Muslim, right? Maybe if I wear a KKK hat on my head, what would that mean? I, I can't think of it. Who knows? It's hard to, it's not possible to tell. This one says Islam. And it has the Islamic sword. And it also has the Islamic crescent and star. But this is also an ancient occult symbol going back to the time of ISIS. And now, do we mean the pre-Egyptian ISIS or the, you know, the pharaohs ISIS? Or do they mean the cult of ISIS, which was from the 3rd century Rome, which was a competitor to Christianity, which modeled itself after the Egyptian cult? Medina, the, this is the city of the Prophet when he died, right? Medina, city of Muhammad. Muhammad, hmm, this fez says Muhammad. Probably just a sheer coincidence. Nothing Islamic about the Shriners at all. Because remember the rule. Islam has nothing to do with Islam. Right? Oh, my, it says ISIS. Do they mean ISIS? As in ISIS has nothing to do with Islam? Or do they mean ISIS? The Well, we'll get there. Let's have a look. So, in the view of some scholars, the greatest rival to Christianity in Rome in the 3rd century may not have been traditional Roman paganism, but the Egyptian mystery cult of Isis. So maybe they derived from this Egyptian mystery cult which sprang up in Rome in the 3rd century. It modeled itself after the secret knowledge that was supposedly part of the, the Egyptian um, era, right, prior to them, well prior to them. And the Muslims, of course, within the Sufis, they claim to have inherited the secrets. They are the only, the sole inheritors and knowers of the secrets from the from Egypt. When they say Egypt, they talk about this line of knowledge, the secret knowledge, the gnosis that comes from that period. Now let's have a look. Mecca, it says Mecca on it, the holy city of Islam, and Fez, the significance of the Fez, the nobles, that's the nobles of the mystic shrine. That's the name of a member of the shrine. They wear rich costumes of Eastern character made of silk and blah, 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 blah. They wonderful people walk on water and yeah, when they smile at you, you feel like you've just had someone give you a massage. Right. So, and um, blah, blah. When pilgrimage to Mecca was interrupted by the Crusades, <laughs> that's propaganda right there. We've spoken about the Crusades. That's an out and out lie. Okay. That is so much trash. Okay, so understand these people have no allegiance to Western society. They have no allegiance to Christianity. They have no allegiance to America. They have no allegiance to Britain. Their allegiance is to Islamic propaganda. This is Dawa, right? Now, let's Freemasonry and its subdivisions, a synopsis. This is an actual newspaper article, and this is a small piece of that newspaper article right there. Okay, and they speak here. Freemasonry is an institution that was created by the Universal Brotherhood of Men. There's another Universal Brotherhood, which we know as the Muslim Brotherhood, a Universal Brotherhood. The Sufis have tariqas, which are known as brotherhoods, which is very, very interesting. We'll dive into that another time, right? It is divided into two rites: the York rite, which goes from the entered apprentice to the Knight Templar. So the Knights Templar. Mm. Now, so they claim a lineage again to the Knights Templar. They claim that the Templars were Freemasons and the Freemasons, well, Sufis. So let's move on from there. Now let's look at these Islamic Shriners. This guy, well, he's a black American. 
and he's got the Holy Quran, nothing to do with Islam. He's got the Islamic crescent and star, just like the Quran, just like Islam, just like the KKK, but no relationship, obviously. And then we've got a white guy. Interesting. Oh, hold on. There's something that maybe I need to bring up. Um, uh, you know what? There's something that I might want to show you. Um, yes, I'm actually going to show you guys this. So this may or may not be interesting to you, but I think it's, well, it should be of interest to you. So uh, again, little things that people tend to leave out for reasons I don't know why. Brill is the oldest publisher, I think, in Britain. Academic publisher, it's over 300 years old. Okay, these people have, the, they have the gold standard in, um, they're the gold standard in academic publishing. This is a document called Islamic, Islamophilic Masonry where Freemasonry was highly Islamophilic. They loved them some Islam. The Masons that loved them some Islam. In a book called The History of Conversion to Islam in the United States. Okay, all fascinating stuff. That's, that's great. And we'll notice here on the left, I have no idea why it's doing that. So, A History of Conversion to Islam in the United States, Volume 1. And it says, White American Muslims before 1975. This book goes back to the 1800s. Okay, this paper, it's very lengthy, it's very detailed, I'm busy way, working my way through it. This speaks of, this speaks of American Muslims who converted, well, a long time ago, in the 1800s. So the question is, how many, people always speak about crypto Jews, crypto Jews, crypto, what about how many crypto Muslims are there? And why are you blaming the Jews and failing to look at the Muslims? Are you a shul for Islam because everyone's a shul for Mossad, right? The people who are saying this, are they shuls for Islam? Are they shuls for the Muslim Brotherhood? Are they Muslims? Secret Muslims? Are they crypto Muslims? These are questions that are legitimate. And besides, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If you're going to say dumb things like that, I'm going to say those same things to you. And I can make them stick because, yeah, the evidence is clear. So understand there's copious evidence. Now you can go into Germany, you can go to France, right to the 1700s you can go into britain there are numerous discussions of highly placed people converting to islam secretly right because it's not exactly made public it's not a big story and who knows maybe they're maybe they and their descendants and their families and their businesses are working on behalf of islam and against your nation right so any comment on this uh, before i go on harry it's just very very interesting uh, yes Only one thing, yeah um decided to subscribe to the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. We're now engaged in um, establishing the new narrative in Saudi Arabia. And so we've got um, our friend Klaus Schwab mm -hmm. actually having seminars alongside um, the um, I can't remember the guy's name. I've, I've, I'm just trying to open the bloody message up. But against a highly placed sheikh in Abu Dhabi. And remember, they had this great um, fair or um, expo on new technology. So there's an intrinsic link now between the World Economic Forum and the Islamic world. Yeah, and I'll bet the economic World Economic Forum is just your friend, right? It's a bunch of wolves talking with a sheep about what's for dinner, right? Yes. Yeah. So understand, there are, there's enough history discussing Islamic conversion by well-placed people, okay? Now, why are we not talking about Islam in, in masonry? Why is it always the Jews? Why is it always the Jews? Right, constantly. Maybe, look, Islam has 1.7 billion Muslims. There's like five Jews on the whole planet. There's like three Jews if you count them in total, right? Including the baby in Israel by comparison. So, so yeah, maybe you want to look at that 1.7 billion size problem and ignore the like, I don't know, 12, 14 million problem. Understand? And is it even a problem? Is it as big as you make out? Is it just propaganda? Are you lying to me? And I must admit that in my discussions with people, because I have access to a lot of these documents and books and things, and I understand the subject well, people are lying. They are lying to you. I know people have lied to me copiously 
and um, yeah, and they're ignorant too. They're ignorant liars. But understand, so the occult revival Islamophilia was that of British and American Masons. Hmm. An occult revival Islamophilia of British, so hmm, Masons from Britain and America who love them some Islam. Interesting. Why aren't we talking about that? Everyone wants to talk about the Jews. Let's talk about the Muslims. Okay. So, yeah. So, obviously, the whole st the narrative of this is nothing to see here. Move along. Well, actually, there is something to see here. And maybe we shouldn't move along. Maybe, again, you guys are just shills for, I don't know, not Mossad, whoever the other side is. Right? ISIS. So, moving on. Among the oaths of the Masonic Shrine Organization is one that says, And may Allah... That's the Jewish God, right? Right, Harry? Allah, the Jewish God? Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. And may Allah, the God of Arab, Muslim, and Mohammedan, the God of our fathers, support me to the entire fulfillment of the same. Amen, amen, amen. That sounds mighty Buddhist. Is that Buddhist or is that Islamic, Harry? I can't tell. Can you help me out here? I, I wouldn't know. It's... <laughs> It's hard to tell. I mean, seriously, I don't know. I'm struggling myself, right? It's really, really tough. So moving on. Okay. Now we've got a white guy, a modern white guy, white American Quran potentate. Hmm, nothing to do with Islam. Definitely. The Quran has nothing to do with Islam. Oh, here we've got a bunch of white guys who are obviously retired executives who may have connections, may have contacts in the business world. Arab, Arabic, Arabia, Arabia, Ambassador, Potentate, Colorado. Hmm. Okay, nothing to do with Islam at all. So the Shriners, as we can see from the evidence, are not Islamic at all. Let's have a further look at their not Islamicness. They first started the Mecca Temple. And the ancient Arabic order, is that Jewish? No, Arabic. It definitely says Arabic, not Jewish order. Of the nobles of the mystic shrine at Mecca Temple. Mecca is the holy city of Judaism, Harry? Uh, yeah. We'd have to Google yes. that. We'd have to Google that. So look, excuse my sarcasm, but understand there's another side to the story that people are not looking at because you know, they want to blame one person only. And most of that blame, I believe, is misdirected and um, yeah. Let's just, so these are the founders of the Shrine in America, the first officials of the order. Clearly a Muslim, clearly a Muslim, clearly a Muslim. These are all just, these just look out and out like Muslims, don't they? No, they don't. They look like white Americans, Brits, upper middle class people, your elite, your business owners, your well-connected, wealthy individuals who are in academia and such. They don't look like Muslims, but man, Shriners, the Shriner religion, if you want to call it that, or the Shriner um, order is through and through Islamic. Okay, and the discuss here, this is by the, the founders. Now let's look at the founders. The ancient Arabic order, and this is Islamic writing, right? That's Arabic. Nobles of the Mystic Shrine, its origin and history, compiled and collated by noble Dr. Walter Fleming, 33rd degree Mason, nothing to do with Freemasonry, and noble William S. Patson, 33rd degree Mason. And they speak of the Mystic Shrine was instituted by the Mohammedan Caliph Ali, the son of Muhammad. Okay, that's Muhammad's son. The son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad, Allah favor and preserve him in Mecca, in Arabia, blah de blah de blah. And the salutation of distinction among the faithful is Salam Alaikum, which is Islamic, 100% Islamic. Right, and here they speak of, now here's a connection again to the, to the Crescent. The secret knowledge symbolized by the Crescent has always, ha always had its devotees in every age, in all civilized countries. And it is yet the master key to all wisdom. So that crescent and star has a different meaning. It's not just the symbol of Islam, but the crescent and star this is from the cult of Isis. And it alludes to the secret knowledge of the Egyptians and of the Babylonians. That is what it means. So it means that Islam possesses the secret knowledge. It has become the 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 holder, the receptacle, the the receptacle, the they've become the masters of the secret knowledge. And this is what the higher levels of the Muslims, the Sufis, this is the knowledge they hold. The philosopher Plato, when asked the source of his knowledge, referred to Pythagoras. If we consult the writings of Pythagoras, we shall find that he points to the Far East, whence he derived his instruction. In imitation of the humility of the wisest of mankind, beautiful, beautiful, just makes me want to cry, we look to the East for light, and we find placed there the beautiful emblem of the newborn light, the Crescent. They're alluding to Gnosticism, they're alluding to Gnosis, the knowledge, which is part of the 
Egyptian secret order. Now let's have a look at Judges in the Bible, <clears throat> a mention of this. Then Zeba and Zalmunna said, Rise yourself and fall upon us, for as the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon arose and slew Zeba and Zalmunna, and he took the crescents that were on the necks of their camels. Because they were the enemies of the Jews, they were the enemies of God. Those who followed the crescent, who followed the religion, the pagan religion, the, had the knowledge of the crescent, the secret knowledge, right, would have been antinomian, more than likely, right, who were standing against the God of the Bible, they were killed. And besides, and the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, besides the crescents and the pendants and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian, the crescents of the kings of Midian, besides the collars that were about the necks of their camels. So understand, so this goes back to your pre well, let's just say Babylonian times. It goes back to the enemies of the Jews, the enemies of the God of the Bible. This is a religious conflict that goes back centuries, thousands of years. Now, let's have a look at these guys. They're famous for their little cake patrols. They drive around and you ask people in America, do you know about the Shriners? Oh, they're driving little cars and they fund children's hospitals. Let's see what else they do. Cake patrol mosques. Right. And he's got the Abu Ben Adam. Interesting. Abu Ben Adam. Abu, brother. Keg patrol. Having fun. Driving his little keg car. Fascinating stuff. You know, little keg car. There, off we go. Who was Abu Ben Adam? I don't know, but he had a mosque named after him. A mosque? Is that where... Phew, excuse my sarcasm, but that's not where Jews go pray. Okay? This is not where Jews go pray. This is where Muslims go pray. And notice it says here, A-A-O-N-M-S. The ancient order, right? The ancient Arabic order, nobles of the mystic shrine. Uh, for those who are perceptive, you'll notice that this is an anagram of a mason and the date is 1922 let's have a look this is the actual building the mosque it is a historical building united states department of the interior heritage conservation and recreation services national register of historic places and of course they've got this here and it says let me see it's two okay the abu ben adam shrine mosque okay and it's 601 east st louis street springfield in missouri so there you go, Islam in the heart of Missouri, since 1922. And Ibrahim ibn Adam, a.k.a. Ibrahim Balki, is one of the most prominent of the early Sufi saints. The only saints in Islam are Sufis. The saints in Islam are the Sufis. They are the ones who are allowed that level of knowledge because they sit at the echelon, they're the pinnacle, the elite within Islam. His first spiritual guide was a Christian monk. Right? I'm sure if we have a look, we're not going to find anything about this guy, because I certainly couldn't, even when I tried. Right, so he learned from a Christian monk. I bet it was an Ebionite or some kind of Gnostic Christian, quote-unquote, which makes him not a Christian. And of course, I've mentioned this before. This is an anagram of a Mason. Let's have a look. The History of the Ancient Arabic Order, Nobles, Mystic Shrine. We had Walter Fleming, wearing his fez and his symbol here. William Florence and Michael at G. Sevier, current imperial potentate of Shriners International. On September 26, 1872, these two men met with 11 others in New York's Masonic Hall. That would mean 13 men. 13, as you know, is a lucky number. 114 East 13th Street. Mm -hmm. Let me see. 13th Street, 13 men. I guess there's just no symbolism there. It's just coincidence. For the purpose of formally organizing the ancient order of blah, blah, blah for North America. Together, they became charter members of the New York temple named Mecca. The Arabic shrine was born. Mecca, just sheer coincidence. Sheer coincidence. Let's have a look at the Masonic Sword of Allah. So this here, we can see the guys wearing his fez. This is a Freemason temple. And we've got a guy wearing an Islamic fez. Notice we've got the chairs shaped like minarets, which is not Islamic at all. It has nothing to do with Islam. This is the black flag of jihad. All right, then we've got the crossed swords. And in fact, it would seem, I mean, it seems plausible that the black flag of jihad actually inspired the pirate flag. Because from a distance, it, the crossed swords and the Arabic writing looks like the skull and the crossbones. Skull, crossbones. So it does seem plausible. That theory has been put forward that because Islamic piracy was a thing. It was a real thing, a very serious problem. And here on this Freemason desk, 
I don't know if that's a Bible or if that's a Quran. If it's a Quran, well, hey, I wouldn't be surprised. But we've got the cross swords, the scimitars of Muhammad. Some say the sword of Ali, but it's the swords of Islam, the swords of Muhammad. So just a sheer coincidence. Your thoughts before I go on, Harry? Uh, I think you didn't mention the presidents yet. The, I'm not going to go into that. That's 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 beyond my pay grade at this point. You don't have the pictures of the Schweiner president? Like the, who was Ford that? And... Oh yeah, of course. Now I forgot that stuff. To be honest, I forgot honestly. Um, but yeah, but exactly. But yeah, someone's mentioned it before, but I completely forgot about that. You know. Um, but yeah, did we have a Muslim in the White House? Was he the first Muslim in the White House? Or was he the first? I don't know, pro-Islamic something. Uh I wanted yep. to mention that he um, he never said ISIS. He always said ISIL, and I always found that odd. Could yes. That have some kind of connection? Uh, yeah, I have to agree. I have to agree. I, I've i never been quite able to make out why, but yes, it struck me the very same way, Nathan. I, um, he never I wanted to call them ISIS because it's the Islamic straight in, in, um, Israel, in Syria, right? Was it? But uh, yeah, yeah I, I'm Iraq not sure why. Syria. Iraq and Syria, yeah, thanks. Um, yes, in fact, he wanted to, yeah, he didn't want to call it, he also didn't want to use the term Islamic State. But they are 100% Islamic. They follow the Sharia to the letter. Uh, when, when they were finally brought down, right, and people started to post their, um, their documents that were captured, their contracts, their, 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 all of their religious works were, were totally standard Sunni Islamic works. They were just following the Sharia to the letter. There was nothing odd about what they did. The only place that they deviated from standard Islam is that they abolished what is called Ruhsa. Right? So there are two forms of of adherence in Islam, amongst many. But there is Azima, which is strictness, which is following the Sharia to the letter. And there is Ruhsa. Ruhsa is is dispensation it's a relaxation of the rules mm -hmm. so muslims today that you know who aren't going on stabbing people willy-nilly they are the ones who are following ruhsa they are allowed to violate to break to not enforce and practice the tenets of the sharia those guys who go crazy on london bridge and stab people they are following azima they're being strict they are following islam exactly as it needs to be followed within the islamic law to the letter and ISIS abolished Ruhsa. They expected everybody to follow Sharia strictly. Uh, but yeah, I can't answer that question, but but it is something that I've also wondered about the same. I should look into that. Uh, Lloyd, I sent to the main chat in the group a picture of uh, Harry Truman, who is another Shriner president, of course. Let's have a look. Oh my God. <laughs> Ararat. Interesting. Ararat, yeah. Another Shriner president. Oh, that is interesting. A Shriner present. That's yeah. Sorry, I I need to look into that. I really need to look into that. That's that's definitely something worth yeah. Um, but definitely, I should actually add that to the slides. I need to add that in. Then I need to do more research because I'm constantly doing that. So moving on, this this symbol you won't find everywhere, but this is part of a group, I believe. Now, take this with a grain of salt. I don't know a lot about them. I'm not sure if it's half propaganda, bogus nonsense, or if it's legitimate. I'm not convinced. I'm not sure. Okay? But you will find this with the ninth degree here and this Masonic apron with this symbol. I don't know if this is something recent, if it's just made up, if it's just something someone did. So I don't know. So take this one with a grain of salt. All right? But... Oddly, it mentions the ninth degree. Within Sufism, there are nine degrees. Within Sufism, there are nine degrees. Okay? And it seems to belong to a group of Gnostics, Islamic Arabic Gnostics, called the Memphis Misraim. So, yeah, take that as you will. But notice that you've got the same sword here and the same, see, the Egyptian pharaonic thing here? Okay, which the Sufis claim to be the inheritors of this knowledge and the keepers and the practitioners of this knowledge. So there you go. Um, so that sword here, it's exactly the same sword you see here. See the curved um, hand guard right there. So yeah, take that as you, take that as you will, um, but just put there for reference. So towards the end, now last few slides. This is the Islamic Temple of California. 
and we should actually have a look. I should actually, I've been meaning to have a look into where the name California derives from, but friends of mine told me it's got an Islamic background, a potentially clear Islamic inspiration for California, California, the Caliphate. And this is a Shriner book from, the, from 1915, March 13th, 1915, discussing their pilgrimage to Sacramento. This is not the, the Capitol building in Washington. This is not the White House. This is the Capitol building in California, the seat of the local government, the state government. <clears throat> and it says here, Islam Temple. They're calling the government building of California Islam Temple. Very, very interesting. Islam Temple. Remember, we have Mecca Temple in New York, and now we have Islam Temple as the government building in California. Let's have a look. It says here, AAO, NMS, Arabic Order, Ancient Arabic Order, Nobles, Mystic Shrine. Uh, I see that you've just sent a message. Oh my gosh. That's Gerald Ford. Good grief. Oh man, that's not good. Aladdin, Salahadin. Oh my gosh. No. And notice here, this image has the nobles lined up as they're about to enter into this building and they're kicking out all of the government people. They're kicking these guys out as they are. You know, so they're throwing these guys out and they're laughing at them and mocking them. Uh, Harry, what are your thoughts on the symbolism that, that is present here? Uh, I cannot see it right, for, uh, right now properly. Please forgive me. Okay. I cannot zoom in. Uh, Pickley, your thoughts or Arthur, what, what do you see when you look at this? And what's the symbolism that you derive from this? Okay, well, anyway, so I'll let you guys figure that out for yourselves, but yeah, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Right, moving on to the next set of slides, and we're about to finish. I, I think yeah. uh, from what I saw, I, I'm not sure if I I'm saw back. it clearly, yeah. it has something to do with the White House? Or, no, not the White House in D.C., the White House in California. This is the, the head of government in California. And these guys are basically, it alludes to them taking over the White House, the government of California, of California. Yeah. Right. I, I found another interesting picture. I think you're going to like it a lot. And yeah, check it out. That is Al Masada. Is it, who is that? J. Edgar Hoover. No way. FBI. Good God. Yeah. So everyone's been talking, look, I mean, we know that, um, who was it that was talking about the, the infiltration of the communists into America? Um, the, that, that senator that was constantly hopping about it. We know he was right. He was dead on. But there's been no real discussion of the infiltration of Muslims and, you know, into, into government in America and into politics. So, yeah, J. Edgar Hoover, that's interesting. I need to add, I will add these into the slides. I'll actually do that. That is shocking information. I need to look deeper into that. So now the question is, what does a crypto Muslim look like? These guys, as you can see, what they're doing is perfectly normal. It's just the kind of thing we all do on a Sunday afternoon. Right, Harry? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, can you repeat your question, please? Uh, just, just look at the picture there. I mean, this is the kind of fun we all indulge in on, a, on, a, on the average Saturday or Sunday afternoon, right? That's what we do in the kibbutz. That's, that's what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking. I mean, except probably in the kibbutz, you do this one naked, right? No, no, not really. Yeah, no, I didn't. I think our no, audience. Did. Yeah. Sorry, Nathan? Our yeah. audience. We uh, in the schools in Israel, it would be an activity to see if um, you could uh, somebody could lead everybody to do it. Yeah, we actually did do that. Yeah, but anyway, something you can find on the gay parade sometimes. You might just find this on a gay parade, exactly, uh, with with a lot less clothing. This does happen to be a Sufi practice. This is a Sufi practice. This is also a Shriner practice. Remember, the Shriners have nothing to do with Islam. I've been reliably told by people who really shouldn't speak, who should just go and get an ice cream and go sit in the corner and, um, I don't know, go, you know, chat with three-year-olds because, well, maybe they should keep them away from children. But this is a Shriner practice, and this is also a Sufi practice. 
right? Because the Shriners have nothing to do with Sufis and the Sufis have nothing to do with Shriners. This is Los Angeles, 1925. This is the Shriners Arab patrol in costume, dancing with people looking on. They're dancing, right? At a gay parade, this would look perfectly normal with no clothes on. So notes, handwriting on, negatives, on negative states, patrol from Al Malaika Temple, LA. Subjects, Al Malaika Temple, Los Angeles, California, ancient Arabic order, nobles of the mystic shrine for North America. Yeah, they're representing, they're putting it all out there for the nobles of the mystic shrine. Good stuff, guys. I'm proud of you. Let's have a look at what the Sufis do. So let's have a look here. This is the Sufis doing their whole mystical dance, which gets them into these trance-like states so that they can get into altered states and commune with Allah, right? Let's have a look at Sufi circle dancing again. Let's have another look. Right, so you all saw that. I'll just play that one again. So what they're doing is Sufi circle dancing. These people are Sufis. They are into Sufi Gnosticism. They're into Sufi secret knowledge. And that's the end of it. All um, done. Wow, what an incredible presentation. Thank you so much, Lloyd. Thank you very much.